This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. I'm really happy to be together here, especially because next week I will be flying Thursday. Uh, uh, so, and I will be gone for a little while. We'll tr- uh, it's been a journey. I just had to go Washington again last minute out of nowhere. Uh, and, uh, normally I have many hours in the evenings to prepare and study. And there I was driving like for five hours almost straight. Um, and I just kept like thinking of Hashem, thinking of Hashem, doing tshuva, doing whatever I can, keep my mind busy and put my <laughs> mind on the road. Don't get me wrong. But, um, so I felt like it was really a, a good time, even though I wasn't face to face with God's words. I was, I felt like I was trying to connect to God through my thoughts uh, and um, and in that way. But I did have some time to uh, read, like I said, this book called "Thank You, God, for Making Me a Woman." Uh, usually, I like to read something again and again, and then I give it over. But you know life. So we'll try today as best we can. I love this book. It really answered a lot of my questions, even at this late stage in my life. Um, (laughs) Many more years to come. I mean, I wish I read this when I was Bas Mitzvah. But uh, they should make this for Bas Mitzvah. Another project? Okay, maybe you'll do it. Anyway, so uh, it's a rabbi who was approached by this woman, kind of really upset, you know, not understanding why women are not counted, why women are sitting separate, why women, and all that kind of stuff. And he was, like, standing there, not really, he says, knowing the answer. So he wanted to investigate more. So as a rabbi, he would know how to answer. And uh, after reading this, I love Hashem even more and love my position even more as a woman. So I hope it'll inspire you. I hope you'll share it with others. And may this rabbi, his name is Rabbi Aaron Raskin, be blessed for taking this uh, task at hand. Um, So first he starts out with... Um, you know, explaining uh, there's this bracha that most uh, people, when they see it, um, and even women, can be like, wait a minute. (laughs) You know, a man says, uh, you know, the, the blessing in the morning, the main blessing, thank God for not making me a woman. And if you notice, the uh, title of this book is Thank You, God, for Making Me a Woman. Uh, so it, it seems shocking, you know, because if you look everywhere in the Torah, there's um, all the careful detail of not even shaming a non-kosher animal by saying it's not pure instead of using the word, oh, impure. Uh, we go to great lengths to not shame bread at the Shabbos table when we're giving honor to the Kiddush cup. So, it's like this, this blessing seems like someone could listen to that and, you know, it could be very, you know, like a sense of something derogatory, something not so positive. Uh, so, we know how much in the Torah it says not about embarrassing people. Uh, shaming is like death, I, you know, Right? One of the Ten Commandments of do not murder, many different uh, sages say it also includes do not shame. Because, okay, average person doesn't kill people. So if you think about Ten Commandments, you know, the average person doesn't kill. But, but really, it's also do not shame. So it doesn't make sense that if, to read this blessing and think it's anything but super holy and super awesome. Uh, And so the explanation is that um, there's something deeper. There's a lot of uh, information that uh, we will hopefully cover today so we will better understand this. Uh, Also in the Torah, in many different places, even the holy forefather, Avram Avinu, was told by God, whatever your wife Sarah tells you, you have to listen. So women generally in the Torah are put in a very high position. Uh, there was a story 
um, that the in here that the that the author writes about that uh, there was a man who came to the Rebbe saying, um, you know, my, my wife yells at me, she raised her voice, and I, it's, it's, I can't, it's, it, help. And the Rebbe said, do whatever your wife asks you. Remember, you have to listen. And so then again, the Rebbe emphasized, whatever. So... Um, the women, especially of this generation, the Rebbe was teaching, that uh, we are reincarnation of the very holy women of Mitzrayim. The women who did not partake of the, the Egel HaZahab, that did not, um, you know, the, the golden, worshipping of the golden calf. Uh, so... Um, also, we see people can maybe have a problem with, um, you know, with, if you look in the Torah, that the Jews are not counted, uh, you know, when their Jews are being counted, the women were not counted. So it doesn't, you know, again, different places in the Torah, if you don't really understand what's going behind it, if you just at face value see this, you'd be like, oh, we're not important enough, like to be counted, hello, you know, but... After reading this, um, you'll have a, 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 hopefully a better understanding. Uh, so women are not counted in a minion, right? And they weren't counted in the Torah. Um, but as the author here says, the rabbi says that the counting back in those days in the Torah was um, associated with death. Because when God was counting these men, these were the men that partook of the golden calf. And so they were going to not, uh, and also the uh, rebelliousness of um, having um, not wanted to go into the Holy Land. So the counting through the half a shekel was an atonement for their soul, first of all, for having participated in this idol worshiping. Um, and the women didn't have to seek atonement because they didn't separate, uh, they didn't participate in this sin. And that's why they weren't counted. Um, and they weren't going to be entering the Holy Land, these men. And they were going to die over the next 40 years in the desert, and that's why God was counting them at this point. We also know that God didn't count the tribe of Levi. Uh, one, also because they did not uh, worship the golden... Wow, thank you everyone for being here. Sorry my back is here, maybe we'll... Yes. Nice to meet you all. Oh, your daughter's in my class. Oh, how exciting. So, um, the men of the tribe of Levi were not going to be dying out for the 40 years. They were going to enter the land. And, um, and so we see that also Aaron Cohen was not counted because um, according to many opinions, Aaron um, was not counted because he was so attached to Hashem that he was beyond number, meaning he couldn't be counted. And he wore so many hats so that he was unlimited. He did this, he did that, he did this, and he had so many jobs. And so um, Rabbi Raskin actually says it's likened to women because women have the ability to emulate God and they bring children into the world, they wear multiple hats and they are really beyond number. A woman is her husband's uh, confidant, the mother of their children, the family psychiatrist, the family doctor, the interior decorator, he says, educational director, chef, and so on. So just like in the Beit HaMikdash where the, um, 
main task of these holy men were chefs and bakers and were slaughtering and, and, and preparing meats and, and uh, also for human consumption. Uh, they also baked the showbread and so forth. So we have so many responsibilities and we emulate Hashem more than men in this regard. We are one and unique and we are truly beyond limitation and number and don't need to be counted. Uh, there was a rabbi in California, and um, he said, um, I don't know what to do. I, there's a group of women in my community that they want to, you know, separate themselves and make their own um, quorum and, you know, have their own shul and have their own prayer group. And... Um, it seemed like when he checked it out that there was nothing in halacha that uh, says otherwise. Um, so this Rabbi Hardikov looked, uh, you know, tried his best to look at the response, and and then um, he contacted, you know, the Rebbe, and this is the response he got. I'll just read it. Our rabbis tell us that the synagogue is considered to be a miniature replica of the Beit HaMikdash, the holy temple that stood in Yerushalayim. Therefore, what was in the temple must be in the synagogue. Just like in the holy temple, men and women prayed simultaneously, um, but separated side by side. The same should be done in our miniature temple, like, a, like the synagogue. So... Um, you know, you would think uh, total separation, you know, for more concentration and, and what have you. But uh, we, the Jewish people, are a whole and our prayers as a whole are so needed. Um, another topic he talks about uh, regarding um, uh, tzitzis and mezuzah. And uh, he says... Here that um, although it is not necessarily forbidden, because there are instances, if you learn in the Gemara, some women did take upon themselves to put tzitzis, and even I remember learning tefillin. Um, the Alter Rebbe from Chabad says that really, that uh, especially for tefillin, that it's really not um, not best to do that. Because even if a person wants to go to the, you know, to reach that kind of level of uh, uh, taking upon themselves something extra, the problem is, is when you put on tefillin, you know, because it has to be on the forearm, it, it would be exposing the forearm and it's not modest. And you would have to take off your head covering to put it on the place of where the tefillin would have to be. So for that reason alone, it's not something to do. Um, some say also that it could lead to a form of arrogance because tzitzis is also not necessarily a halacha that a man has to do. So it would be like as if a person is taking upon himself something that even men aren't really commanded to do. They're commanded if they're wearing four garments, uh, four corner garments. So, um, but then over the years, just to make it simple, then men just, uh, uh, and not just to make it simple, but for some reason then it became like a custom that men wear tzitzis all the time, not just when you wear a four-corner garment. You mean during davening? All no, all the time. Oh, so yeah. you said that it wasn't a halacha to no, wear tzitzis? No, it's a halacha to wear tzitzis if you're wearing a four-corner garment. I thought tzitzis was a four Oh, no, no. I'm so, to, yeah. And that's that white thing. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, so that's that. And then, um, and then there was another um, uh, beautiful teaching here that, uh, you know, when you, when, when you think about some of the sentences in the Torah, like, for instance, it says, oh, women have, like, das kala. Like... Oh. No, we're not. Okay. Uh, when no, it was my fault. Um, so the teaching here is that uh, das kala means something completely different. Das kala means not weak. It means they have kal. It's easy for them. It's easy for women to take knowledge and apply it. Men, on the other hand. They're not gifted with this extra wisdom called Bina, 
And so they can learn do 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 even know things by heart, but to get that knowledge to penetrate their heart so that they can actualize what they know is not easy. And that's why we see so many well intended, knowledgeable people, <clears throat> men, uh, that know a lot, but you know, when it comes to applying it to their children or applying it to their wife or even to their customers, they have a hard time to actualize what they know to be true. And so Das Kala for women is not, oh, they're lightheaded, they're light-minded. They're, uh, no, they, it's easy for them. They learn something and they can apply it that much sooner and that much better. And an example that uh, is stated here, it says, a man will go to a Torah class and he comes home and his wife asks him, okay, so what did you learn? Oh, the rabbi spoke about kosher. Really? Uh, the wife will say, are we going to keep kosher now? And the husband says, ah, oh, we'll worry about it tomorrow. He shrugs it off and then he goes to sleep. Next day he forgets about it. That's it. When a woman comes home from a class, she begins to throw away all her non-kosher food and dishes in the garbage already that night. Already that night she's ordering online new sets of dishes for milk and meat before her husband even knows what's going on. So... The husband will ask, what is this all about? Oh, the rabbi said she'll do it and she'll implement it that night. Um, so that's why when you see men putting on tefillin and the strap falling, you know, kind of vertical to the lower parts of his body, it represents the need of this man to have extra powers to get that wisdom to flow into all parts of his body, to get that wisdom to be ingrained in his heart and in his ability to uh, actualize that knowledge with his body. Uh, women don't need to do this uh, because to them it comes more naturally. And um, there was uh, the uh, um, another topic that was very uh, beautiful. I'm just like going through main points here, but there was so much more uh, than what I'm even saying. Uh, I just um, I just want to comment about something. If God gave women extra bina. Right. The reason because she has to educate the kids. Yes, definitely. That's why she's talking too much. Right. Right. So the we, we will get to that, um, mm -hmm. which is stated in this book as well. So, hmm. So now let's get back to the blessing. Uh, thank you, God, for making me according to your will. Meaning, you made us perfect. You made this according to your will, not according to our will. Uh, because men, well, they need to be refined more. They need to be circumcised on the eighth day. Whereas a woman doesn't need circumcision. In fact, uh, the Talmud actually says women are born circumcised. Um, also, uh, there was... Um, a teaching by uh, Rebetzin Shimona Tsukernik in her book, I believe it was, or maybe it was her tapes that I had many years ago, when she was explaining that if you look at all the blessings, thank you for not making me a slave, thank, me, thank you God for not making me a man, and not and not and not, all these knots um, are written that way because, um, like, in reality, no one's ever really free, except a woman more, um, to not be really um, a free person. So you would say, why don't we say the blessing, thank you for making me a free man. Well, we're not always not enslaved. Because sometimes we're enslaved by our passions, 
we're enslaved to chase after honor, money. So we can't say, thank you for making me free because we're not really free. Thank you for not um, making me a man, right? We don't say that. We say, thank, uh, thank you for not making me a woman because um, at that stage, a man may not necessarily really be the man. He might act more like... Um, you know, uh, without that, uh, in Hebrew, um, the, the, like, the par excellence of the man that has reached that, you know, hierarchy is called Adam. That's why Adam, right, um, is called that because um, Adam is the ability to um, reach that level of self-actualization, to have self-mastery and to have like it's called moichin de godlos an expansiveness of the mind so that um, a person can act like a man you know and even in many places if, if nobody's acting like a man around you act like a man like so a man can maybe not reach that in that uh, perfect state but with a woman the reason why it says um, thank you for making me according to your will is because um, women have less challenges of not, uh, you know, they're, they're not as easily, like, discombobulated to reach that level of womanhood. So uh, whether it's a slave, whether it's man, it's like you don't know if they're going to really attain it. But with a woman... It's like we have such extra wisdom. Hashem blessed us with such spiritual powers that we're achieving that just by being born. You know, when you think about going back to Adam and Eve, it's much easier in life to work by the sweat of your brow than to give to have pain in childbirth. And I think that's where it started, that it's, it's, it's deeper and it's harder to be a woman. Mm-hmm. And I know in the 21st century, or in the 20th century, I married an athlete, I know a lot of macho guys, they all think, thank God, they're not a woman. Because mm-hmm. they think they're not as smart and they're not as strong. Especially That's what he says in this book. And they yeah. really believe. Yeah. And and I've heard it so many times. I could never do that. I could never read well, it. Oh, oh, for because sure. Because men really, and we raise these men. Right, right. Some great men that we raise. Right. But they're men. But as much as the difficult, right, right, as much it's difficult, the plate and the uh, amount of responsibility, I really believe, in my humble opinion and my experience, I rather be in that position and have that extra wisdom to not be needy of others to get me to that position. Like, um, the idea is that women light Shabbos candles because she has the power to bring out the light in others. Everyone else is dependent on us. So i rather be with a heavier load but not dependent on anybody else to be the real me. Whereas a man and children are more dependent on the Aishas Chayel, on the woman of valor, to help raise them and help bring the light out of them, just like a woman in her stomach expands and has the power to bring out the latent powers of the man's seed and bring up his legion, their legion, so too, metaphorically speaking, we have the power to bring out the latent gifts of man. And that's why it says it in Tanya, because it says the... um, a woman, right, um, is the crown of her husband. So, um, and the oral Torah is likened to the woman who has the power to bring out the secrets of the Torah. What are the Torah? The, the secrets. Because, yes. like it says, put on tefillin. But what does it mean to put on tefillin? So, the, or, the um, explanations of what and how is, is the extrapolation of the basic halacha. So the same thing, we have the power to bring out the latent gifts and, and, and seeds of our family, just like we're able to do it physically. Now, if you look at the stomach that expands and makes the room for another entity, so too does a woman have more the power to expand her mindset to be able to incorporate contradictory 
ideas, contradictory um, personalities, meaning what happened up in Shemaim before the world was created? Chesed and Gvura, two opposite forces, meaning there was kindness and there was severity. And they could not coalesce and because they would like bang into each other and shatter because if you can't mix some ingredient like let's say olive oil and, uh, and vinegar, it just separates. No matter, <laughs> do this a hundred times, it just does not mix. So out in the outer world, these two forces could not congeal, could not meld into one. So they shattered and, and, and then... Um, and then we down here as women have the ability to take opposing natures, get along with them, accept them more than any other creature. Because our mind has the extra level of wisdom to expand physically, literally, more and more we can accept, love, be patient with, and we see it. Women are more patient with their children, generally speaking. They have a better coping mechanism to deal with this erratic, strange creature sometimes called child. You know, mm-hmm. and the man's like, ah, uh, but he can't deal with it. He, he gets uh, all out of uh, uh, out of proportionally angry and uh, and takes it so personally and gets so angry and and is so strict and so challenged by the the crying baby but we are capable because we have this extra wisdom our mind can in, incorporate opposing energies and 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 not crash and so Mary, and break from you it you said you wish that some you had out of the book when you were about mitzvah yeah is that for a 13 year old um, 12, i guess a, a 12 13 year old that likes reading and is you know has been I mean, the concepts. Yeah, the concepts. Yeah, edible. yeah. I think it was plainly uh, and very simply, beautifully written. So it's not so complicated. I'm literally. Sorry. Yeah. I'm um, Oh, oh. So um, that's why I said I wish I had this because I wish I was a man. Like for many years. <laughs> not that I was a feminist, or not that I. I. It was very hard for me to. Um, deal with Judaism as I was becoming bas mitzvah with these uh, ideas and uh, that were lingering in my head not understanding mm-hmm. uh, you know like go to shul and like I want to read from there or I, I don't know like different things that uh, why do we have to be back here you know it's very very normal to feel this way if you don't study this and not know the reasons behind um so now I'm uh, making up for lost time. <laughs> oh, so we're back on this, this idea. So Hashem made us according to our will. Um, his will. Uh, according to His will. Uh, so there is uh, um, the Chabad custom not to say this. Interesting, and that's why you notice in a lot of Chabad sitters they don't have this blessing of thank you God you made me according to your will. Why? According to the Alter Rebbe, he says, um, uh, by reciting it, it sounds like justifying an evil judgment, meaning accepting a negative judgment upon yourself, as if you were saying this. Like this is how it could be translated. This blessing. Okay, God, you made me a woman. I'd rather be a man. But if this is your will, then okay, I guess I got to accept it. And that's how I felt growing up. If we're not taught this, it's very easy for us to uh, see this, especially when you grow up uh, sometimes seeing a lot of, I'm sorry, male chauvinism around, you know, or men demeaning women and or making them feel like uh, they're not as great so Marianne, or don't you think I mean I once read that the greatest mitzvah you can do is give joy to others and when you go to a party you go to anything it's the woman who's the hostess oh definitely right definitely and, and you can say thank you for making me according to your will because the woman is the one who makes everybody feel good can I give you more of this are you comfortable with your chair right. Um, 
you know, I'll introduce you to No, this for is, sure, for this sure. Is 80, this is jo- Definitely. I mean, you know, it's not the man who does that. No, the, so, that's what I'm saying. Here, this whole book yeah. praises and praises the powers of mm-hmm. the woman. And um, so um, so I want to also add that if you look at the back to Chava, like you were saying at the beginning of it all, uh, it's interesting. It says here um, that Chava is... Um, uh, a name that you would think would not have been chosen for the mother of the future. Uh, you would think it should be called Chaya, life. She's the one giving life, having babies and uh, continuing uh, her legacy through carrying that baby. But if you look at the word Chava, it means to tell, to reveal a secret. What secret is Chava revealing? The secret of creation. Uh, again, her power to bring life, to reveal, to bring out the secrets of what's buried in our family, our husbands, our children. And if you look at the numerical value, the gematria is actually 19, which is uh, a sacred name of Hashem when spelled out, yud K and vav Uh So... So Chava, like every woman, has the power to reveal godliness in the world. I mean, how can you reveal godliness at its max? Give birth to a baby. Uh, She starts by revealing herself, and then she has the power through revealing the godliness within her to reveal the godliness and help manifest that godliness in her spouse and her children. Uh, A while back, I gave a class from the Mystery of Marriage where the uh, Rabbi Ginsberg talks about the scene. There, Moshe is begging Hashem, please, please, I want to see you face to face. And God says, I'm sorry. You can only see the back so, this explanation is so deep. This is like the key of marriage and family counseling success. And what is the explanation? Is <coughs> In order that you're going to see me, you need to get to the back of you. The back meaning the deeper essence of who you truly are. Work on revealing your godly, latent talents and gifts Because within you, God is saying, is me. So deep dig within yourself. Refine yourself from anger. Refine yourself from sadness. Have more faith. Have more emuna and bitachon. Go with the flow. Let go. Let God. Learn. Connect. Reveal your godly essence. And when that comes out, you'll be able to see the front of God. Because in the back of you is the front of God. So, why is this in the Mystery of Marriage book? The explanation is you need to find yourself. You need to refine. You need to fix these negative character flaws. Get to the real you by bringing in more light, you know. There is darkness, but that's because there's an absence of light. Learn, pray, bring in the light, and your godly essence will be exposed. Once your godly essence will be exposed, you, the back of you now, what's deep within you, is outside, then it'll come to the light. Your husband will see you happy and refined. Your children will see you with emunah and bitachon. Then that will bring the front of the, the, the back of them also to the front, meaning what's buried within them, the deep light that has to be exposed, will finally come out to having looked at your own back and revealing your own essence. That's the power of a woman. And a man and children are dependent on that. How many times we hear stories, and especially in the Gemara, it says... A wicked man can turn holy with a holy woman. 
But a wicked woman can turn a holy man wicked. That's the power of a woman. It doesn't say the opposite. It doesn't say if a woman marries a wicked man, woohoo, she'll become wicked. It doesn't say the opposite. Because a man and his children are dependent on the power of the woman to bring out the light. What's the Prophet Chabad says instead of Shasana Kirtsamna? There isn't. Oh, you just don't say anything? Yeah. yeah. And what does yeah. the man say? Yeah. Does he say Shalom Asana Yes, Misha? yes. Oh, the man said yes. Shalom Asana yes. Misha? Yes, yes. Like because he cannot say thank you for being a man because at that day he might not be a man. Okay. What I was told is the reason the man says Shaloa Sanisha, thank you God for not making a woman, is because the man is given war mitzvot. So it's and interesting. So he's thankful for the addition. He has mitzvot. 14 extra mitzvot. He's thankful for that. Uh, right. But every other mitzvah, the woman has. Only 14 he has. So those extra ones, he's happy for. Because he needs them more than a woman to refine and get to that self-mastery. So, um, I want to tell you that uh, I, by coincidence, I was... It's very interesting. I just happened to have, like, papers and... I typically, um, oh, this one and this one. So I put like papers all over the place. And as I told you, I was on my way to Washington and I had five minutes to pack and like get going because I wasn't originally supposed to go. And, and normally I pack like even three or four books for uh, a day trip. And uh, all of a sudden I'm like, oh, okay, so what did I pack here? And I'm, I, I used this to, the night before to put, uh, uh, can I, and it talks about modesty. And womanhood. So I'm like, wow, interesting that it was in this in this book. And this is from the Rebbe. And um, because really, the one of the main ingredients for us as women to be able to keep that unbelievable extra wisdom, extra holy powers, is to our modesty. Because, um, as you know, in the explanation is like when you have the blood vessels in your body and you have a restriction of the blood flow, right? It seems like, oh, you're restricting, you're restricting. But it's actually a very positive thing because if there wasn't that restriction, then too much blood will come into the hands, too much blood will come into the heart, and it'll be a mess. So many times you see things in the Torah that seemingly is restrictive, but it's really not. It's really the opposite. So it seems like when you're covering yourself, it's restricting. It's, uh, but what I was taught in many different places, that um, the flow of godliness will be restricted and made like for you to keep with the all Torah and mitzvahs, but especially with modesty. So, for instance, um, like you would not uh, want the hand to get too much blood when this flow of godliness and spiritual energy and extra wisdom is coming to you, a way to safeguard it and not leave and get indiscriminately dispersed, you keep laws of modesty. So again, it seems restrictive, but it's not. Not only for physical well-being, but for mental well-being. Because this extra wisdom we want to keep for ourselves. We don't want it to be dispersed indiscriminately for the, and, and not have it be contained within our body. Just like you have a bottle of wine and you know you're going to go on, a, on, on some kind of roller coaster ride. So you like make sure to put the plug in in the bottle, whether whether it's seltzer or whatever you're drinking, and uh, or water, and then like so that it won't just randomly go everywhere. 
and then like uh, you know you'll be famished and and thirsty and and want to hydrate and no more water so um so this is the um sneas um it says here it's as we know the torah is the torah of our life and it's a truest guidance a guidance in all aspects of our daily lives and ensures a gainful and truly rewarding life and um especially regarding um the theme of tsnias in some respects the torah places greater emphasis on tsnias than on any other detail of our daily lives and tsnias is the fundamental element to our jewish life to walk modestly with your god and there's so much rewards that the zohar says about tsnias um uh, many stories of our sages um how jewish women in different generations merited outstanding heavenly blessings in the merit of their tsnias not only for themselves but also for their husbands their children and grandchildren interesting there was a story here that said this woman one wasn't having babies and she became religious and she did mikvah and she did everything right and so they wrote a letter to the rebbe and god uh wanted a blessing to have children So the um, the the Rebbe said um ask your mother to go to the mikvah cuz she was going to the mikvah she was doing everything right so interesting uh the mother didn't want to so she reported to the Rebbe my mother you know what what should I do ask your grandmother to Oops. so the grandmother went to the mikvah that month she had a baby so the teaching is that some mitzvah now can act retroactively so that the by the grandmother going to the mikvah made her holy as if holy in the union of making the mother of this woman that made the child now holy to be able to have a greater blessing physical blessing to have a baby So even getting other people to do one extra mitzvah, uh one extra act of kindness retroactively like uh, can make such a difference for one today like this. Um there was another story of a uh, when the catenists during the time of uh when the Russians used to snatch the 5-year-old children in the um in the Russian army for 25 years the Fridika Reb noticed and made a public uh a storm about this that the women who were extra careful uh in their modesty during that time were the children that were not snatched like it really brings a lot of protection and a lot of blessing and every little extra effort can make a huge like difference uh, in in so many ways. Can I can I add? Yeah. Sh- short eyewitness account. Uh there was a woman that I know who wasn't having ch- who had children, but she wanted another child. She wanted and and for years she wanted she and her husband tried and it wasn't happening. And then she heard about going to the Rebbe and I happened to go with her. I didn't initiate going to Rebbe. But I went with her and I stood there next to her. Wow. And she said to the Rebbe, "Rebbe, my husband and I so much would love to have another child." You were actually and there. Rebbe, I was there. Wow. And he gave her $2. He said, uh-huh. "This is oh, a three dollars. One dollar for her, one dollar for her husband." And he said, "This dollar is for your bait for your child to come." I'm paraphrasing. Uh-huh. And I'd say within 2-3 months They were expecting a baby and yeah. I went, I've heard about this. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So wow. I mean, I can personally attest to women who are not having babies for 7, 8, 9, 10 years and um I just suggested them to go learn with Sara Carmeli Mikva classes and and they right away that month went and that month they got pregnant. So definitely these um spiritual practices is not just for some future spiritual ah 
Ganeidin. It's literally physically affecting our lives now. And Bezrat um, Hashem, we shall hear more and more good news. Um, so I pray that, um, you know, the laws of the Torah regarding women now are, is a little better understood from being in the class. I highly recommend to read this and read it with your children, um, uh, grandchildren, whatever, and get them to really know God, you know, that he's not some kind of feminist or something, you know. <laughs> you know? He loves us. He put us on a very high place. He's given us enormous, unbelievable position, like, um, you know, in the uh, elite core of his army to bring Mashiach and all the good Techov uh, Umiyad Mamish. So I want to stop here and. Um, Can I just retroactively? I meant to say this at the beginning to thank our hostess and to dedicate yes. this class yes. to her mother yes. today. Yes, Aliyat yes. yes. uh, uh, And can you say her name again? Yes, this is for the memory of the honor of my mother, oh, no. Leia Bapatzala and Kohen. Leia Bapat Bapatzala Hakohen. Wow. Wow. And of course, thank you, Torah, any time for, and, and Devorah for every week uh, getting it, bringing it back, recording it. Um, now we'll do a uh, little meditation. Oh, okay. Definitely we'll pass that around. Thank you. Um, the money now is going toward the finishing up a tuition. Yes, we can pass it around. Uh, for a child who hopefully will cover the last 1,000 left on his account so he can go to camp too. Um, unfortunately, there, this child was uh, almost uh, going to go back to public school after uh, the mother approached me saying, I really don't want my children to be in public school. And uh, I need help. So there's. Uh, so she approached me, and I said, "Okay, I'm helping her child stay in yeshiva." There's what Hashem. And last uh, week we uh, raised a thousand seven hundred seventy-five. Uh, thank you for everyone's contribution. Yeah, and now hopefully we'll have about another two thousand to finish, and we're getting there. There's what Hashem. Um, yeah. Uh, if you want to make a check, you can put it to SANE, uh, which is a nonprofit organization and it's tax what is deductible. S A N E, Save and Neshama Endowment. If you look at the. Uh, Save the, and Neshama Endowment? Yeah. Yeah. Because, so uh, first of all, this is. Great neck, it's a Marxist group. Oh, no way. Crazy. Oh, my gosh. Well, first of all, I have to tell you. Um, I'm very into mental healing and mostly I raise funds for family who one member or more is having a crisis with mental disorder you know when the husband's not working and like but um, but I have and it's very dear to my heart also helping children stay in yeshiva because I was zapped out of yeshiva um, we had moved to the valley, and the valley school closed down, and the, it was like a one and a half hour drive, and thousands of dollars then, like I remember, my, it was like shockingly also expensive back then, uh, 40 years ago or more, um, and I ended up in public school. So, and it really messed me up for a couple of years. As strong as I was, and okay, I didn't take drugs and I didn't do the things that, but it really like, I went from nourishing, Ghana and nourishing food for my soul to nothing. And I went from, you know, being alive and happy and pulsating. And, and when I went to shul to like severe depression, severe depression it was such a and and the and this just a lot of stuff so um that was god's will it was i it was you, definitely don't you think that it made you appreciate oh for sure hashem so knew more. that i had to go through that yeah. so that i can realize the difference between being in public school and in and in, in yeshiva and know that when you're not getting nourished in a blink of an eye, like in a few like days, 
to it could happen that quickly that you become so morose, uh, morose and so sad and so lifeless and a lot of other things. Um, so, and that's what I'm doing with the. Uh, all... Oh yeah, thank you. Carol, Carol, we did not discuss this before, but would you like to say definitely at all? And yeah, maybe you feel like yes. saying something. Maybe you don't feel like saying something. Yeah, if you do, Is you could have the opportunity like to, to say it to the world. Oh, okay. But if you don't, then we could do it after the oh, uh, oh, right, recording right. is over. Oh, oh, it's yeah. Still yeah, it's still recording. Oh, I didn't yeah. Okay. So would you like to do it in? Oh, okay. Well, so we come here, come here. Morning, no, come. I think it'll be, and then we'll do a meditation yeah, after. This is amazing. I'm so thankful. <laughs> here you go. Just hold it. Oh, no. I, I Attach it to my shirt. Here, come sit down here. Okay. Oh, I never did this before. Okay. No. Just... <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. I wanted to be there with I you. I want to thank all you girls for giving me strength. When I went to the cemetery this morning, <clears throat> we're taught that we can't speak directly to the person who whose soul went up to heaven, that we have to ask God to intercede for our prayers and to... In other words, can you ask mommy or can you ask or can you please forgive me for the things that I, I didn't do for my mother and that can you ask my mother to forgive me for the things that I didn't do for her and that and that all the times that I wasn't perhaps a perfect child, will you ask her to Channel forgive me? me? So when I said those things, I was really talking from my heart. And I asked Hashem to forgive me for the things that I may have not done right and that I forgive my mother for the things that I thought that maybe were not done right to me and that she didn't give me a break, that she was too, too stern with me, but that I understand that it came from such a place of love and such a place of wanting me to be the best I could be. And now as a mother and a grandmother, I do understand I do understand what she wanted for me and that she had a certain finite years in this life and she, and she had breast cancer and she wasn't given long to live and so she worked her hardest to make all these things that she wanted us to do <sighs> work out and become real to us in the finite years that she felt that she had to live. So I want to thank Hashem for giving us the opportunity to go to a parent's grave and to ask for all these things and to intercede on our behalf and on their behalf for the things that we want and also that we want to bless our children and grandchildren with. And that's just what I want to say. Thank you. And give us the opportunity to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Carol, as I've said to you before, your parents are so proud of you. They're all that you are for all that you do as a parent and all that you do for your community and friends. Which is not so much, but I thank you. Florence actually caught me on the way out of the cemetery while I was just washing my hands. And she gave me such comfort in all the words that she said because she happened to have known my parents pretty well. She lived in the same apartment building as my family, as my parents. And so she knew all the players. And that gave me great comfort. Thank you. Thank you, and thank all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. It's the least we could do for wow. you, the more that you do for all of us. Dr. Carol Lerman, thank you. Thanks for having me. You've done so much for so many people for so many years. Mm-hmm. I just also want to tell you that Phyllis Kirsch, who oh. else I know her, is dying now. Oh. She's not responsive. Ah! <gasps> and... Um, I think that if we can recite psalms on her behalf... Oh, my gosh. It would be a great... She used to come to her for class. Her comfort. Can you find a song? I'm going to recite it. What? Oh, psalms. my gosh. Any psalms you want. Mm-hmm. We'll do it right now. Here's the psalms. So I say them in English, and there's one... Okay, so let's all say to him so right now, and... You can... You can be, Miriam, would you like to leave us in like 1.30? Or yes, okay. Um, Are we still on... Yeah, we're on tour anytime, but I guess all of you out there can also say to Helen, one of our students, I just found out, one of the members of this class who used to come, but she got not well, uh, is 
not conscious? Is that what I'm... She's not conscious? She's not conscious. Here's Psalm 130. You want to say is this, uh, this is going to be in English. Okay. I'm going to tell you that right now. Well, that's what I speak. Okay, and this is for... Oh, my gosh. Zipporah Hinda Batema. Zipporah Hinda Batema. Out of the depths I have cried unto you, God. Oh, why don't you say this? Here. Come, come back here. You want to come here? so many things here today, okay? This song is said for our dear friend, Zipporah Hindabatema, whose Thursday classes at Tehillim. If I didn't say them, I would never have been drawn to saying Tehillim. And there was about six of us at her little white table, and we each said our part and together we all set a book of Tehillim, which is why I have reached out to all of you to say Tehillim on Shabbos, to most of you anyway. And um, if you ever want to join in that and become a part of a book of saying all of Tehillim, please let me know. But this psalm is 130, and I'd just like to read this. Out of the depths I've cried unto you, God, God, hear my voice and let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, who would stand? But there is forgiveness with you, that you may be feared. I wait, for the, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word do I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than that watching for the morning. I say more than that watch for the morning. Let Israel hope in the Lord our God, who are the Lord for the Lord is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption. And he shall deem Israel, redeem Israel for all its iniquities. Amen. 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 So it says, For Hinda, Batema, may she have comfort and peace, and may her family also find comfort and Muna in their strong belief in Hashem. really in shock I didn't know I didn't know I know Phyllis but I didn't know it just went very fast it just out of nowhere Phyllis Phyllis Kirsch I don't know a girl who is 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 humble so sweet and and whose family is humble and they gave to so much the Himanyanam every Friday and every Saturday for people who couldn't walk that far to the shore Think about a good mile away from the shul. So many people who, after 20 years, couldn't make it to shul. So they'd have a minion in their house. Oh, and she wow. would provide all the food and everything. It's so, you know, sometimes you copy the, peop- the people right, that, right, you, right, right. that you wow. see who've done the same thing. And she made drinks. Wow. You know, like sodas and, you know, things. And and and, and, every, and she'd have always candy for me. She you know, I love candy. <laughs> and she would give me the non pareils and the Hershey's with the almonds. She knew, like, what I liked. And she'd always wrap me up with two eggs because she's got to eat those first. <laughs> <laughs> and so we all learn from, from, from people who, who do one better than us or more than that. And in her memory, may we do the things that she did for us and being hospitable and for having holy things at her house. Mm-hmm. Amen. 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 Wow. I'm sorry, but there's a couple of block, cars blocking me. Oh, okay. So I don't... Okay. Okay, so let's just one minute just uh, thank God that we're a woman in our own special way mm-hmm. and, like, and that we're alive and have another moment to enjoy all of our being and uh, to make and our light shine. To you, Miriam. And, and you thank you. Will you be here another week or not? I'm really debating my flight is third. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.